Welcome to the people of God as we gather together this evening on a Sabbath evening to worship our Lord. Uh, we're glad that those of you who are visiting with us have decided to join with us for our worship service. It is our hope and our desire that you would be blessed as well as our God would be praised with what we do here this evening. Our call to worship is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verse 13 and 14. There we read as follows, And every creature which is in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb forever and ever. And we join with that uh, choir uh, that proclaims the glory of the risen and the ascended Jesus Christ. Uh, whoever lives and sits at the right hand of the Father. Now let us open our service with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we have begun the day in your house, and we now also end the day in your house. We thank you for the uh, privilege that is ours, that we can conveniently and freely, openly join together with our brothers and sisters in the faith, and that we can worship you in spirit and truth. We thank you for our interceding high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who presents us and also our worship to the throne of the eternal God, uh, sanctifying us. And so we pray that you would be with us in the evening hour of this day, that you would receive our praises, uh, for to you alone belong all glory and honor, both now and forevermore. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. For our opening song of praise, we'll take our Trinity Psalter hymnal and turn to selection 183. We'll sing all four stanzas, standing if able, all four stanzas of selection 183.
And we do confess together that our help is in the name of the Lord who has made the heaven and the earth, and he greets us with these words. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Amen. As a Christian congregation, we now take the opportunity to profess our Christian faith. We join with the church throughout the ages using the words of the Apostles' Creed, saying together in one voice, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us then join ourselves together for congregational prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, uh, we join our hearts as well as our voices together to praise your name, and we are thankful that you are God, that you are eternal, that you are infinite in time and in space and in power. But we thank you that in all of your infinite perfections, you are also a compassionate Father, we thank you tonight, especially that you remind us by your word that your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, occupies the exclusive position of your right hand, exercising all of your power over all of the aspects of the created realm. We thank you that you remind us that he is the King of kings and that he is the Lord of lords. And as we face another week, soon to unfold its hours and days, uh, we ask that this truth would comfort us, but also motivate us, that we might know that by your grace and by your mercy, our spiritual identity is that we also are called to be prophets, priests, and kings. So often we look upon the chaos of our culture and we grow alarmed or perhaps despondent. Uh, we pray in such times that you would remind us that while we may not understand it, that all events continue to unfold themselves according to your sovereign will. And so may we find a solid reason for optimism. May we know that your kingdom will grow and that your kingdom will increase and that your kingdom will advance. Now we pray that it would do so, especially through the preaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as the administration of the sacrament of baptism and the Lord's Supper. We pray that your kingdom would grow within our own hearts, that this congregation might grow numerically, but especially in our spiritual understanding of the riches of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we also then might grow in the expression of fellowship and the spirit of faithfulness. And so we ask for your blessing upon all of the congregational activities uh, that will take place in this week the opportunities for times of study, the opportunities for times of encouragement. Our Lord, we pray that you would give us as 
individual believers, but also as a congregation, a zeal to be evangelists, also in the various relationships that we have as we go about our calling and our vocations and in our workplaces, as we interact with our neighbors in this community. And we pray, Father, would you give us a winsomeness in our conduct and in our speech that we might testify of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we pray, too, Lord, that we might be faithful in raising up the next generation of the church. And so may we be very uh, zealous in our work as fathers and mothers, as grandfathers and grandmothers, communicating covenant truths from one generation to the next generation. We thank you, Father, for uh, the schooling that assists the parents uh, in the spiritual training of children. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless our schools, uh, that they might be places of physical and spiritual protection. Uh, we pray, Lord, that they might stand upon biblical truth. Uh, we ask that you would give wisdom to teachers and to administrators and to various uh, board members uh, as day to day and also long-term vision plans are made. And we pray also for the schools of our seminaries that seek to train up men for the gospel ministry. And we pray, Lord, that they might be kept faithful in communicating the things that they have received to the next generation of men called to be ministers of the word and of the sacrament. And we pray, Lord, for the Hofflands and for uh, the studies uh, of Dan, also for uh, the children. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for a good transition for Dan and Leah, as well as their children in the new community and in their temporary church uh, home away from home, as well as uh, for the kids, their schooling, for friendships that have been made. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would continue to watch over this family. Uh, we pray, Lord, for those of our congregation who mourn, we ask that you would comfort them. We pray for those who are shut in into a place of care. We ask that you would provide them all that they stand in need of. Uh, also, we thank you, Lord, in this community for the various relief organizations, uh, the homes uh, of assisted living, uh, for the various individuals who work in hospitals, for doctors, for nurses, for support personnel, uh, for first responders, for uh, a variety of relief and aid services. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you would use all of these organizations uh, to meet the needs of the community here. But above all, we pray, Lord, for a spirit of reformation to blow throughout the churches, that you would uh, raise up a generation that would stand unashamedly uh, in the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and proclaim both the gospel promises but also the gospel implications and obligations uh, to the members of this community. And we pray, Lord, that all of us would humble our hearts and acknowledge that you are Lord and that you are King. We pray, Father, as we think of the community uh, for the Nadeborg family and for Ryan as he's transitioned in his recovery uh, to a, a different place of therapy. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you would continue to bless him with restored measures of strength and health, mobility. We pray, Lord, that you would uphold him spiritually and psychologically, emotionally, mentally, and his family also. May they not lose heart, but may they continue to endure uh, and to persevere day by day. Uh, Father, we pray for Reverend Caleb Johnson as he ministers, seeking to plant a church in Gig Harbor in Washington. We thank you for your providence sending visitors to their midst. We ask that if it is your will, these visitors might become new members, uh, and that also the youth catechism labors that have been undertaken this fall might be blessed by your sovereign hand, and that they might be fruitful in training up the young people of this uh, church plant in the doctrines of the faith. We thank you, Lord, that you have provided uh, men of elders for this church plant, and we pray that in due time uh, a deacon or two might also be uh, installed within this church. We also pray for Wellsburg United Reformed Church, and Lord, we ask that you would continue to uphold the work there, uh, give unto Reverend Worries all that he stands in need of, uh, also to the council members, and the congregation, we pray that the light of the gospel may continue to radiate forth from that church and that community. And we do pray also for our own congregation. Uh, we ask that you would bless office bearers with faithfulness and with energy for their labors. 
and also in due time when new office bearers are elected. Lord, we humbly ask that you would reveal unto us the men whom you have chosen to serve as elders and deacons. And looking forward to the future, we pray that you would continue to provide us with men who are qualified and equipped by your grace and also willing uh, to serve for the advancement of the kingdom here in the church. Uh, we ask that you would bless the civil magistrate as we can consider that matter again this evening. Uh, we pray, Lord, for those in various levels of leadership, and we ask that you would influence them by the principles of your word, that they might recognize that they are appointed men and women, and that they are answerable to you, and that they are to govern according to the principles of your word, identifying that which is good and that which is evil, and rewarding and protecting those who do good and punishing those who do evil. We pray, Lord, that you would stay your hand of judgment and that you would bring about uh, a return to the protection of the sanctity of life and the sanctity of marriage, uh, as well as the, the dignity, uh, the goodness of work. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would also remember your promise that you would never leave nor forsake your people. And so may we not lose heart in doing well, uh, seeking the, the good of the city which you have called us to live in. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless us then this evening, also with the preaching and with the hearing of your word. As it goes forth, we ask that it would accomplish your purposes. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. We then turn to our song of preparation in the Trinity Psalter hymnal, Selection 2A. We'll stand if able, and we'll sing the four stanzas, all four stanzas from Selection 2A.
Congregation, this evening in your Bibles, we would direct your attention to a reading from Acts chapter 19. In your pew Bible, you can find this on page 1,279. We're going to be reading from Acts 19, verses 21 through 41. After we read from Scripture, we'll also be reading a section of Article 36 of the Belgic Confession, and you can find that in your Forms and Prayers book on page 196. The section that we're going to be reading from Acts, I think it's uh, quite a remarkable section, but of course that could be said and should be said of all of Scripture. Uh, But I find it remarkable because of how contemporary it sounds. Uh, There is what you might call uh, social unrest that is caused by the Apostle Paul's preaching. Uh, And in that social unrest, you find the masses coming together. The masses of the community, you might say. They come together and they're characterized by all sorts of unrest, but also confusion. Uh, And you'll hear a most uh, potent statement about the confusion of culture. And in the midst of that confusion and unrest, you find a civil magistrate uh, fulfilling the purposes of the civil magistrate of maintaining a certain measure of order in society so that the gospel can continue to be proclaimed uh, in the city of Ephesus. And you'll notice that that is exactly what our Belgic Confession summarizes as part of the purpose of the civil magistrate, to maintain order in society so that the church can continue to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ until the end of time. Uh, So we turn our attention to Acts 19, beginning with verse 21. When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the Spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a time. And about that time there arose a great commotion about the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many gods, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised, and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath, and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion, and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's travel companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. Then some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent to him, pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing, and some another, for the assembly was confused. And most of them did not know why they had come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out for about two hours, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there? who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Zeus. Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. For we are in danger of being called in question for today's uproar. 
there being no reason which we may give to account for this disorderly gathering. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Thus far our reading from Scripture, we then turn to the Belgic Confession, Article 36, and we began looking at the truth within this article last week uh, by focusing upon the first two paragraphs. So I want to read this evening paragraph uh, 3, 4, and 5, beginning on page 196, the third paragraph of Article 36, and being called in this manner to contribute to the advancement of a society that is pleasing to God, the civil rulers have the task subject to God's law, of removing every obstacle to the preaching of the gospel and to every aspect of divine worship. They should do this while completely refraining from every tendency towards exercising absolute authority and while functioning in the sphere entrusted to them with the means belonging to them. They should do it in order that the word of God may have free course the kingdom of Jesus Christ may make progress, and every anti-Christian power may be resisted. And we'll conclude reading uh, at that point this evening, anticipating next Sunday evening, Lord willing, looking at the final two paragraphs. A congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, some of you are involved in uh, the building trades. Uh, in a former day, I was also involved in the building trades. And uh, I think of an illustration that perhaps is helpful to introduce the material that we plan to consider this evening. In the building of a home or some type of building, whatever it may be, uh, a barn or uh, a place of manufacturing, a variety of what we call subcontractors are usually involved. Uh, and each subcontractor has his own trade. So, for example, in a home you have... Uh, the concrete contractor, uh, you have the, the framer, perhaps, the rough-in crew that will construct the walls and put on the roof. Uh, then perhaps you have the roofing contractor, and in, inside you have the various electricians, the plumbers, the heating and cooling. An absolute chaos would be the result if they all showed up at the exact same time and tried to work in each other's way. And so every general contractor knows that in addition to uh, finances and weather, one of the matters that must be carefully attended to is the scheduling of subcontractors. That each subcontractor is scheduled to work on the project at the appropriate time and in the appropriate order. And, and when such a schedule is followed, uh, then there is, you don't want to say, a beautiful harmony. As each person knows his role and also fulfills his role. The same is true when it comes to the role of the civil magistrate. Especially that role in relationship to the role of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. When and if the civil magistrate humbly recognizes its role, it serves a most beneficial purpose for the advancement of the kingdom of God and for the well-being of human flourishing. But if the civil magistrate forgets its role or goes outside of the realm of its role, the result then is absolute chaos. And so with a scripture text before us such as Acts 19, which I really believe it is an illustration of a civil magistrate recognizing his realm and his purpose. Uh, with such a scripture passage before us, we want to turn our attention this evening uh, to the civil magistrate, looking at our belief concerning civil government, you might call this part two. And I want to just simply say that it's very important for us in our current day to consider these matters thoughtfully, carefully, biblically. Now, you might often hear, you know, this political cycle is going to be a very, very, very controversial political cycle. But as I dabble in history uh, a little bit, I, I'm not sure that there's ever been a political cycle of elections that has not been highly contested. 
As political cycles go and as elections come and go, they always bring a certain amount of heightened anticipation and focus upon uh, the potentially divisive nature of such an election. I also draw your attention to certain winds uh, of teaching within Reformed churches. Uh, and, and there has been much discussion, some of it profitable. A lot of it, I think, has been uh, more just noise than real profitable discussion. But there has been a lot of discussion lately in Reformed churches on the relationship of the civil magistrate or the state uh, with the church. Now, it's not my intention this evening uh, to solve that riddle, but perhaps to shed some light uh, upon the riddle of how should the church and state interrelate and interact. So we look again tonight in the time allotted to us, our belief concerning civil government, part two. We want to first of all look at the civil government and the preaching then secondly, the civil government and the spheres, and then thirdly, the civil government and the kingdom. So what we believe based on the Bible, as summarized in our Belgian Confession, about the civil government and preaching and the spheres and the kingdom. So first of all, the civil government and preaching. From the outset, we want to be very, very clear that the civil government, the civil magistrate, at a national level, at a state level, at a local level, the civil magistrate is not to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That task, that task is given to office bearers, particularly office bearers of the minister of the word and of the sacrament within the church. And so you find already in Acts 19 a clear distinction between the Apostle Paul and his co-laborers and the civil magistrate. And we want to be clear because at times in the history uh, there has been an appeal made by churches to the civil magistrate uh, to actually engage uh, in the study of doctrine and in the proclamation uh, of the gospel. We think of what is commonly known as an Erastian form of church government. Uh, it was the common form of church government in the early 19th century within the Netherlands where the king was viewed basically uh, as the head of the state. We find this in form at least, how, how it actually functions I'm not sure, but in form what well, we've just seen uh, the transfer of the crown in England from Queen Elizabeth. Uh, to King Charles. And King Charles, at least in title, is identified as the head of the church, the head of the Church of England. Uh, and with all due respect to Queen Elizabeth and her reign and also her profession of faith, of Christian faith, of a particular Christian faith, not just a broad general faith. But with all due respect, we say that the king or the queen, or whoever the civil magistrate may be, is not tasked with the solemn responsibility of preaching the gospel. Uh, but the civil magistrate does have a function in relationship to the preaching of the gospel, a function that we want to identify as both a facilitating role and a contributing role. So the civil magistrate, and we remind ourselves of what we introduced last Sunday evening, that if you wanted to boil it down in the simplest of terms, the civil government has a twofold purpose as they uphold order in society, to punish those who do evil and to protect and reward those who do well. And when the civil magistrate does that, by doing that, they facilitate or they provide the opportunity, they, they create the context in which the church then can go about its task. And so the purpose of the civil government is to be an agent of God's justice and to uphold a certain measure of lawful order in society. And that's exactly what we find happening in Acts verse 19. The culture is carried about by all of these emotional appeals to the idol, to the idol god of Diana. Uh, and you notice that 
uh, these silversmiths, they, they know that their lucrative profession is threatened by the preaching of the gospel. And so they are stirred out of selfish, idolatrous motivations to work up a frenzy among the populace. And as cultures often are, the culture is carried along and they all storm into this great assembly in verse 32. Some cry one thing and some another. The whole assembly is confused. And then I love this statement. And most of them did not know why they had come together. And whenever the news cameras report on some political uprising or some rioting in the street, I think of this verse and I, I see evidence. Yes, one group cries one thing and another group cries another thing. But the majority of the people, they have no idea why they're even together. But they are worked up in a frenzy. And if that frenzy was not checked, it would have resulted in no doubt a negative outcome for those who were ministering the way, an early term for the Christian faith. But thanks be to God that the civil magistrate stepped in. Verse 35, notice the city clerk. What did he do? First, he quieted the crowd. Now, we're not told exactly how he did this. Was it just that he was a person of remarkable influence? Leadership skills that had been granted him by the common providential gifts of God? Uh, did he perhaps employ uh, some type of force or at least show of force? We're, we're not exactly sure how he went about this. But we know the outcome, he quieted the crowd. The civil magistrate, the city clerk, was used by God to facilitate and to work, you might say, with a certain logic with the unruly populace. And he said, you know what? You need to be quiet. You don't have any legitimate charge against these men. They've done nothing wrong. They're not criminals. They're not disorderly persons. You ought not just take them by, by mob violence. And there's almost this impression that, that if the multitude had been carried away and had acted out in mob violence, that then the city of Ephesus would have been in danger. Perhaps the, the Roman emperor would have sent a military force to crush the rebellion. And so the city clerk says, be quiet. These men, these gospel ministers... They are not robbers, verse 37. They are not blasphemers. If you have a case, if you have a case against them, there is a lawful way in which you are to proceed. Now, this serves then what we mean by a contributing role, by facilitating the maintenance of order. The civil magistrate contributes to the advancement of the kingdom. Because preaching, preaching is vital to the advancement of the kingdom. And now we want to acknowledge that our society doesn't always realize the importance of preaching. But I just want to make this comment. Our society doesn't recognize the importance in preaching in part because generally, broadly speaking, the church doesn't recognize the importance of preaching and the advancement of the kingdom. And so again, broadly speaking, you find so-called organizations that take the title church engaging in all sorts of activities but minimizing the importance of preaching. If you gave the Apostle Paul one activity that he could do in Ephesus for the kingdom of God, I can tell you exactly what it would be. Because it's the one activity that he did engage in. Preaching. And in order for the society in which we live, perhaps to have a rediscovery of the central importance of preaching, the church 
Let's go back to the Scriptures and Reformatory Act and also emphasize the essential, vital role that preaching of the gospel has in advancing the kingdom of God. Because what preaching does is it proclaims the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it calls people, individual persons, and it does this again tonight, it calls persons to respond to the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in repentance and faith, and thereby to become members of the kingdom of God. And so person by person throughout uh, the record of human history is added unto the kingdom of God as they come under conviction of sin, but also to the exercise of faith in response to the Spirit blessing faithful preaching. And in order for preaching to continue, God has appointed the civil magistrate at national levels and at local levels. He has given that civil magistrate a very clear task. Maintain order so that the church can preach the gospel. And if that is the task, then a warning to the civil magistrate is don't impede the preaching of the gospel. Don't put obstacles in front of the preaching of the gospel. Don't hinder the work of the church in the preaching of the gospel. And as we continue the ebb into the spirit of the times as characterized in Romans 1 and Romans 2, we are going to have to have the courage to remind the civil magistrate humbly but also pointedly, don't get in our way. We must preach. And we must preach biblical truth. And that transitions us into our second point, the civil government and the spheres. If the civil magistrate has a facilitating role and a contributing role, that is understood also as we understand the whole concept or the idea of spheres. Spheres of authority, spheres of operation, circles of influence. And there is a misunderstanding and Young people, I, I, I hope, I hope in your schooling, when you study government, when you study civics, I hope that the common misunderstanding of this phrase, separation of church and state, is pointed out to you. First of all, the phrase, separation of church and state, as many of you hopefully know, but this is for especially our young people, is not a phrase that is found in the United States Constitution. It's first used in a private letter of correspondence from Thomas Jefferson. And when he uses that phrase, separation of church and state, he does not intend that the church would not have any influence in the realm of the state, or that the state would not have any influence at all in the realm of the church. What he means by that phrase is contrary to the way the entire European government political structure was set up. There would not be a national church in the colonies. And he is indicating that there would be the freedom of the exercise of religion according to the private conscience. And this is what we mean by sphere sovereignty. There, there is a certain realm, a certain area of life over which God has appointed the state. And by state, again, we mean national government, state government, local government. There is another realm or sphere of authority over which God has appointed the church as an institution with its office bearers. And we would also identify that there is another sphere or realm over which God has appointed parents. And this is becoming a contested issue within our day. You notice if you're paying attention, there's this ongoing debate in the public realm. Who has authority over the child? Is it the state with its school system or is it the parents? And we say, without any compromise, it is the parents Fathers, mothers, train up your children in the fear of the Lord. And we have long understood this relationship, but perhaps we've taken it for granted uh, that parental organized schooling can be 
used for the education, for the training of our children. But the authority is not to be usurped by the government and by some national-wide school system. The children belong to the Lord and belong underneath the authority of the parents. And now in many ways I suspect that we are preaching to the choir because I hope and I pray that none of you as parents are, are about to capitulate and give up all of your authority over your children and allow them to be taught whatever some board would deem appropriate or necessary. But we need to continually remind ourselves of these truths because I'm not a prophet nor a son of a prophet. I don't know how many years or decades uh, but I can almost see the train coming down the tracks where some type of governmental agency or organization will come to our schools and will begin to pry into what exactly we teach in regards perhaps to human sexuality. And some expert will make a proclamation and say that what we believe about human sexuality, according to their opinion, is detrimental to the psychological well-being of the children. Now we say exactly the opposite of what these pretended experts advocate as far as human sexuality is what is actually most devastating to the children and to the young people of our communities. But we must understand what has popularly, popularly been known as sphere sovereignty. There is an area over which the civil magistrate has a punishing of the evildoer and the protecting of those who do well. And there is an area or a realm over which the office bearers of the church have authority, the preaching of the gospel, the administration of the sacraments, and there is an area over which the parents have authority. Now there is a, a certain degree of overlap. And that overlap is found especially uh, in this regards, uh, that the church has the responsibility to identify and to remind the state of what the state's divinely appointed role is. You'll notice that the Belgian Confession, some may say it sounds archaic, but, it, but it's very contemporary in its warning in regards to the civil magistrate. Now, of course, uh, here you, know, you had no idea of separation of church and state, uh, and so you had uh, a king who would have usurped power over every single sphere or realm. But if you read again the paragraph at the bottom of page 196, speaking about the civil magistrate, they should do this while completely refraining from every tendency towards exercising absolute authority. Doesn't that sound like a contemporary check upon governmental intrusion? Stay in your sphere, is what the church humbly and yet confidently says to the state. Don't transgress. Don't tell us how to preach the gospel. Don't tell us how to administer the sacraments. Don't tell us how to worship the one true God. You just maintain order. You punish the evildoer. You protect the good. And we will go on preaching. And we will go on baptizing. And we will go on teaching. And notice this phrase, while functioning in the sphere entrusted to them with the means belonging to them. And so this understanding of sphere sovereignty, time doesn't allow us to flesh it out in further detail. But there, there's going to have to be continual reminders from the church in her public preaching, when the text indicates it. Also the church, as we commonly identify her as an organism, as we go about living as Christian in our communities, with all of the privileges and responsibilities of participating uh, in this grand experiment uh, of our 
constitutional republic. We do have a responsibility as individual Christians to seek the well-being of the city in which God has called us. And there are a variety of ways which we as individual Christians can and ought to be engaged and involved. Ways in which we can send the message to the civil magistrate, stay in your sphere, but do what you're supposed to do in your sphere. And then we as a church, as an institution, we will stay in our sphere. And we will do what we are supposed to do. And we will do what we are supposed to do, not with the sword, but with the spiritual sword of the Word of God. And this, when it works together, uh, will generate what we consider in our third point, the civil government and the relationship to the kingdom. This will produce a progress of the Christian kingdom. I just by way of reminder and by way of review want to clarify again what is the grand end of human history? What is the, the goal to which all things are moving? I think you find it wonderfully summarized as we talked about last Sunday evening, moving Adam and Eve in Genesis 1 and 2 all throughout the halls of human history until we see that beautiful picture in Revelation 7, verse 9. I believe Revelation 7, verse 9 is the main goal of human history. And what do you have there? After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number. Now, of course, you need generations of procreation to get that great number. That's the way God has instituted the growth of human society. You also, of course, need the preaching of the gospel. The preaching of the gospel to get that great number. Because look at what they are doing, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So if you want to talk about the progress of the human race, the progress of humanity, anything that moves us towards the picture of Revelation 7 verse 9 is true progress. Anything that is out of step with that picture in Revelation 7 verse 9 is not progress. And when we hear our culture speaking about progress, we need to biblically analyze what they are saying. Because so much of society's developments is no progress at all. But a continuing coming to fruition of acts that are underneath God's righteous judgment. Read Romans 1 and Romans 2. And then ask yourself, is the breakdown of the marriage in Western culture progress? Absolutely not. Is the astronomical rising of birth rates out of wedlock progress? Absolutely not. Is the all sorts of deviant Sexual perversion? Progress? Absolutely not. And the civil magistrate must be reminded of that. But the church must continue its mandate. Because you can look at a city like Ephesus in the first century. You could go to Corinth in the first century. And you could find all of those social ills, all of that wickedness, all of that rampant sin in those cities also. I'm always struck, what did Paul do? Did he walk into the city square and just wring his hands and bemoan the sad state of affairs? You might say at times he did when he went into Athens. But he went in and preached. Preached Christ, 
preached Christ crucified. And it always produced the same mixed response. The anti-Christian kingdom always lashed out, sometimes physically. At other times, they attempted to lash out until a city clerk intervened and quieted the crowds and said, if you have a case, take it to the courts. We can be thankful that in our communities, by and large, we still have such city clerks, if I may call them that. We meet here tonight completely unhindered with a great deal of order in society. And our hearts ought to be overflowing with profound gratitude that this privilege is ours. And our prayers ought to be earnest that this privilege would also, by God's providence, continue for our children and for our grandchildren. Parents and grandparents, maybe even great-grandparents, I want to ask you tonight, do you pray fervently for religious freedom for your children, for your grandchildren, for your great-grandchildren? Prayers such as, Lord, may they also have the wonderful gift of being able to freely gather together on the Lord's Day because of the civil magistrate's maintaining of order. Uh, well, this ought to be something of our understanding of the civil government. Uh, more can be said, and we anticipate attempting to say more uh, next Sunday evening. Uh, but our prayer and our praise ought to continually ascend unto Jesus Christ. No matter what the state of the civil magistrate, remember, He is Lord of Lords, and He is King of Kings. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again tonight for the freedoms that are ours. Some of us, for many, many a decade, we have gathered ourselves together corporately, freely, without any thought of persecution or oppression or governmental interference. Many of us have had the opportunities to live in an orderly society, and we thank you for that. And we do pray, Lord, that you would enable us to speak biblical words uh, when appropriate to the civil magistrates and also to be involved uh, in uh, the political activities of the cities and the towns, the states and the nation which you call us to live. Uh, Lord, we ask that by your providence you would so influence uh, the, the city clerks, so to speak, of our own day, and that when the world rises up in unrest, and would seek to quiet the voice of the church, may the city clerks quiet the voices of the unrest and grant us the opportunity to continue to preach the gospel and to administer the sacraments and to advance the kingdom. For Jesus' sake, amen. For our song of dedication this evening, uh, we'll turn to selection 421. Uh, in our Trinity Psalter hymnal. We'll stand if able and we'll sing the four stanzas, all four stanzas of 421.
At this time, the deacons will receive our evening offering, which will be given for Wellsburg United Reformed Church of Wellsburg, Iowa. Afterwards, we'll stand to sing our doxology, which this evening will be the fourth stanza of 153. And now, people of God, receive the blessing of your Lord and go together in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.